name is Robert Stringer. I'm the Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at Pharmalex. My name is Teresa Nicoletti. I'm a partner at Mills Oakley Lawyers. I'm the Head of Health and Life Sciences for the National Practice. I'm Ian McGregor. I'm Professor and Academic Director at the Lambert Initiative at the University of Sydney Brain and Mind Centre. Ian touched on the attitudinal elements of, uh, of the prescriber base there, that not all prescribers in the, in, in the GP land are, are convinced of the evidence, and so it seems a bit more of a centralisation of, um, of prescribing. And that's probably also driven by clinics as well. So because of the complexities associated with the, the SAS program and supply, a lot of clinics um, would be getting much more than their proportion of, uh, of representation within the GP area. So I think that probably Probably contributes to why the, the GPs are a little well significantly less involved than pharmacy. Yeah, so some of the challenges there is that a lot of the work has been done uh, focusing almost at um, at the scientific level and the uh, and the proof of concept level in the published work in these areas. But it's not been thinking too hard historically on the regulatory space. So how you actually build a regulatory file, what a regulatory quality study is required to, to meet the regulator's um, requirements. And so you have a disconnect between a lot of the publications and, this, and the evidence that's out there versus what would be required to have a, an approved product in Australia or the US or Europe. It's interesting, the, the, the evidence gap that uh, prescribing is galloping ahead for I think more than 130 indications that patients are currently being treated with medicinal cannabis products and we barely have adequate evidence for one condition uh, if you hold it to modern pharma standards. So that produces an interesting tension for prescribers who have great enthusiasm amongst patients for these products but their professional colleges might be much more skeptical and indeed even advise them not to prescribe unless it's part of a clinical trial. In terms of conditions, chronic pain is the, is the big one. More than 60% of current prescriptions are for chronic pain. And we have the Faculty of Pain Medicine telling their members not to prescribe medicinal cannabis unless part of a clinical trial. Pain's complicated because there's so many different types of pain. And um, then you've got more than 240 medicinal cannabis products currently available. You've maybe got a hundred different pain conditions. How do you patch that all together? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite bamboozling and difficult for people that are running clinical trials to know where to focus their efforts with so many products. But there are some interesting ones going on. There's a lot of observational data that's been gathered. Uh, we are targeting particular types of pain, spinal cord injury, neuropathic pain is one large trial we're running at the moment. We're also interested in epidermolysis bullosa, which is a horribly debilitating skin condition uh, that we're working on. And also osteoarthritis, which is incredibly common. Uh, millions of sufferers worldwide, and we're working on a CBD topical that we think is going to be highly effective for that. In 2016, when uh, the, the Narcotic Drag Drugs Act was first changed to legalise cultivation, production and manufacture of medicinal cannabis, carried with it a very restrictive scheme where there was an overlay of federal and, and, and state regulation for medicinal cannabis products. And the reason for that is that there wasn't a lot of knowledge about the quality and safety of medicinal cannabis products in, in particular. So regulators were reluctant to introduce a facilitative scheme for that reason. But as we've gained more and more experience around it and, and as we've become more comfortable with the types of products that are being supplied to the market, um, the scheme has relaxed to some extent. So there's now only a federal layer of regulation for access and we've seen the numbers of prescriptions rise quite significantly since that happened. From the point of view of how we regulate medicinal cannabis products, there are only two products that are currently registered in the ARTG, Epidiolex and Sativex, and both of those drugs are for quite restricted indications. When we've got, as Ian said, more than 130 different age, uh, indications that cannabis can be used for. And so in the main, the products are all unapproved therapeutic goods that are used for indications that are not on the register and they're being supplied under the unapproved access schemes, which are the special access scheme and authorised prescriber scheme. The cost of those products is high because they can't be subsidised, and that's because the only products that are eligible for subsidy 
are those that are registered in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. And so it's a bit of a double-edged sword. We want access to the products and we want it um, quickly. And so we've introduced these unapproved access schemes, but that means that they can't get subsidisation because they're not on the register. And so the only way we can address affordability at the moment is either to get those products registered in the ARTG or otherwise have more competition in the market, which allows supply and demand to equil equilibrate and prices to start to come down. There's some trends, for example, in chronic pain, it seems to be starting to stabilise a little bit, uh, whereas with mental health conditions, particularly things like ADHD, PTSD and depression, we're seeing exponential growth at the moment. Part of that might be uh, a little bit more of a relaxed attitude amongst prescribers. Um, so chronic pain, we don't have much of an argument if you've got severe chronic pain that a trial of medicinal cannabis is not necessarily a bad thing, but particularly when you look at the alternatives like opioids and gabapentinoids and the substantial liabilities that these existing prescription medications have. So chronic pain was there from the ground floor, if you like, in terms of prescribing. It was always the number one indication. I don't think the market's saturated, but I think if you're a patient that wants to trial of medicinal cannabis, it's fairly straightforward to organize that. There's a lot more reticence amongst prescribers for uh, prescribing for things like depression. Uh, they've all been told at medical school that cannabis is uh, anathema when it comes to mental health, you know, that cannabis causes schizophrenia and so on. As prescribers learn the difference between THC and CBD and become aware of CBD's potential in mental health conditions, I think we'll see a lot more prescribing. That's perhaps part of the reason that we're seeing this exponential growth for mental health conditions. Although having said that, a lot of the products being prescribed do contain THC. But the GPs generally have a view of medicinal cannabis. They, th they think it's relatively safe. And certainly our recent survey shows that they consider medicinal cannabis to be much safer than things like opioids, benzodiazepines, uh, antidepressants, and antipsychotics. Interesting, in the early days of medicinal cannabis availability, it was nearly all oils. And the trend we've seen, particularly over the last year, has been a large increase in the prescribing of flower products, where they now represent about 40% of all prescriptions. And there might be a couple of reasons for that. One is that you get a much more rapid effect with, with flour. Uh, so that might be if you have chronic pain, if you vaporize uh, medicinal cannabis flour, then you might get a very quick alleviation of that pain, whereas it could take an hour or two hours for an oil to have an effect. Uh, the bioavailability is much slower. Um, we're hearing of people with anxiety who are vaporizing CBD flour to get an instantaneous relief of panic and uh, situational anxiety. So that's a reason. But another thing that may well be happening is this um, gravitation from the green market, you know, traditional illicit users of cannabis who overwhelmingly use flour into the prescribed market. And they don't want to change their use of flour to oil because they've always used flour for self-medication with cannabis. They just want a prescription product rather than an illicit product. So that might be another driver. I think when you look at medicinal cannabis, there, there's a belief structure associated with it, for want of a better word. So there's, there is scientific evidence and there is, um, there's medical evidence that, that has efficacy in various areas. But I think... Patients have uh, a belief that it will work as well. That's, that's my personal experience. And so they approach it with a positive mindset. Um, and if you had, particularly in, in areas like treatment resistant um, conditions, you're looking for something that, that's new and it's, it, it seems to be coming from a different direction. And to me, I think patients find that attractive. And I included in the slides there the comment that um, natural equals good. And I, I don't think it goes quite as far as that, but, but there is a, a belief that there is some, some level there that they will get some benefit from that. And, and that drives a, a patient acceptance there. And I think from the regulatory sense that that is building on that. And these, these changes that seem small to start with in the legislative area open the doors to a, a whole new industry that didn't exist um, by 2015. And so you can see that without having those changes, you, you'll always have a roadblock in, uh, in how the patients can, can actually receive the product. So that would be comments I'd put for that. For me, the start of my journey was personal. My, I watched my father die in uh, 
quite excruciating pain from uh, metastatic cancer. And this was prior to legalization. So I, I started to see the therapeutic potential of medicinal cannabis um, in a number of pro bono cases that I dealt with of patients who couldn't get access and were being treated with polypharmacy and not getting the outcomes that, that they needed to have any quality of life. And through, through legal representation, we managed to get those patients access. And the transformation in the quality of life um, and their ability to manage not just the symptoms of their disease, but in some cases to reduce um, the size of tumours and overall um, therapeutic benefit was quite obvious. Um, and that really cemented my willingness to get involved in this industry and to really drive regulatory reform to ensure we had as accessible a scheme as possible. And we talk about um, clinical evidence, getting robust clinical evidence, but I don't think we should discount these individual cases. We always talk about these cases as anecdotal evidence, evidence but these are real examples of patients that have been treated with many other drugs beforehand and have been able to dispense with most of those drugs by taking medicinal cannabis. And you can treat that like an N of one clinical study and harness that sort of information. Um, and so I'm convinced that there is therapeutic value. We just have to work out which products um, are the most suitable for particular indication. And there's a lot of work still to be done, but I th I'm in it for the long haul. I think it will become a, a very entrenched medicine more and more in years to come. Yeah, so at the beginning of the Lambert Initiative, we were dealing with a family who had a, a, a young child with a severe pediatric epilepsy that, and they were treating her condition by illegally sourcing a product containing CBD. And indeed, the, 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 the father of Caitlin Lambert, Michael Lambert, ended up in court uh, on charges uh, for possession and supply of, um, of cannabis. And uh, we helped defend him. And I've done, like Teresa, I've done a number of pro bono cases as well, defending people who are doing what any parent would do or any family member would do for um, a loved one in need. And uh, it just seemed really bizarre that the, the state and the country would prosecute people for doing what anyone would do if they, if they were sane and had compassion. Um, so thankfully, we've moved on from that situation. The, the, the very product that uh, you know, Michael Lambert was in court for is now available on the PBS <laughs> in Australia for that same condition that Caleb Lambert has. So what a long way we've come uh, in terms of supply. The remaining, I mean, the big problem at the moment, I think for patients, there's two, there's driving and there's cost. So if you're on a THC product, there's no exemption for uh, roadside drug testing and conviction for driving with THC. And we're using our signs to show that it's perfectly rational to allow patients to drive on THC products so long as they don't feel impaired. Uh, and that would just bring medicinal cannabis in line with opioids and benzodiazepines and other prescription medicines that have the capacity to, to impair driving. So we need that urgent change for, for our patients. Uh, the cost one, uh, a lot of people who are wanting to access medicinal cannabis have chronic illnesses and disabilities, and there are people that often are finding it hard to make ends meet. Uh, so we do need to get um, other medications that are more widely used for conditions, mental health conditions and chronic pain, onto the PBS. That, that's the big frontier at the moment in terms of improving accessibility and making sure that cannabis-based medicines can be distributed to those that need them. And um, please thank the presenters again.